The revolution is real, it's live, and as some comrades say, it's lit, right? <laughs> Lit. Lit, lit, lit. The revolution is lit. Uhuru comrades and welcome to today's Amali Taught Me Sunday study featuring Chairman Amali Yashatella. My name is Abdullah Muhammad, member of the African People's Socialist Party, working in the office of the Deputy Chair, as well as your MC for this morning. Today's study is highly important. We encourage you right now to share this stream. Invite your friends and family to it so that as many of our people as possible can be involved in this study. This week, the chairman continues reading from the book Materialism and the Dialectical Method by Maurice Cornford, chapter 3, pages 28 through 37, Mechanistic Materialism, and chapter 4, pages 38 through 45, from Mechanistic, mechanistic to, material, to Dialectical Materialism. In this study, we will learn that political and historical events occur due to the conflict of social forces, which helps us to understand and identify problems and their solutions. We ask that you begin to prepare your questions regarding the topic so that the chairman can expound <coughs> more on certain ideas. To deepen our understanding of this, I proudly introduce my leadership, the brilliant theoretician, the brilliant theoretician behind African internationalism, the theory developed with the understanding of dialectical materialism, or the dialectical materialist method, leading to practical solutions for African and colonized people worldwide. Let's bring them on with a round of Applause. Chairman Obali, yes, you tell him. Uhuru, comrades. Uh, first thing I want to do is just a, a self criticism uh, for the fact that we are laboring over this uh, text written by Maurice Cornforth, who was a member of the British uh, Communist Party. And uh, the British Communist Party, like most of the uh, Communist Party of that era and most of them of this era, European-based Communist parties, uh, were simply a kind of uh, uh, a left liberal uh, organization and their, and their understanding of things were uh, liberal, uh, but he <coughs> offered uh, what appeared to be <coughs> even now like a, a magnificent framework uh, within which this discussion could be held. <coughs> My self-criticism has to do with the fact that I've recognized for a long time the limitations of Cornforth's work uh, uh, and, uh, and had more than 35 years ago determined that I, I need to write a book on um, a dialectical and historical materialism or work on that uh, just to clarify a lot of things because I think that what we're looking at with this uh, is a method of, that was really developed by Marx and Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, uh, uh, really developed and, and given uh, 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 
significance uh, in the most recent uh, period. Um, and it was a method, it is a method of investigation uh, and analysis that allows for the development of uh, a scientific uh, philosophy, uh, a scientific worldview. And, and uh, they even marked himself as limited in being able to use that method uh, effectively and, uh, and a cornforth uh, is even, you know, is less capable, obviously. And the thing is that uh, I've never heard uh, Marx himself refer to himself as a Marxist. In fact, I've, I've uh, read or heard that he once said that all I know is I'm not a Marxist. Uh, but most of the people who've considered themselves Marxists and uh, who belatedly came to love uh, Karl Marx and uh, what he had to say, uh, they often referred uh, to dialectical materialism as uh, as Marxism. Uh, they uh, referred to the method itself as the philosophy. We have a serious disagreement with that uh, because the fact is that using this method uh, of dialectical and historical materialism or dialectical uh, materialism as a means of investigation and analysis, uh, we have come to different kinds of conclusions. So uh, we think it's problematic uh, to do as Cornforth and so many people who refer to themselves as Marxists uh, do, uh, we think it's, uh, it's problematic <coughs> uh, to refer to uh, Marx, to dialectic materialism uh, as Marxism, and uh, we, uh, we have different, uh, we've come to different conclusions using this method, and so, and we are not Marxists, and we say this not uh, as an attack on Marx or Marxism uh, and Marxists as uh, we often hear coming from uh, folk who are uh, really attacking Marx because they want to uh, protect the status quo, the capitalist status quo. Uh, and so they use the attack on Marx as a means by which to defend uh, capital, capitalism, and the social system. We uh, say that the problem with Marx and Marxism is that they uh, do not have the ability uh, to get to what the essence of the question is that will make revolution uh, 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 inevitable that provides for uh, a genuine revolutionary worldview, and that's what we have sought all along. And and because we've sought a, a genuine uh, revolutionary uh, worldview, uh, we've come uh, into uh, conflict with a lot of people who call themselves Marxists. Uh, and uh, uh, but we really appreciate this the scientific method, uh, the dialectical and historical materialist method of investigation and analysis. Uh, so, I wanted to say that, and I wanted to say that we have to look at this question of, uh, of, of, of philosophy uh, because of where, because it's absolutely necessary. Because if you don't have your own philosophy, the revolution cannot uh, produce its own philosophy, then uh, we end up borrowing the philosophy of the oppressors. And uh, it is a critical moment in history where uh, uh, capital, capitalism uh, is doing everything it can uh, to hold on, to fend off uh, the uh, struggles of the peoples of the world that's uh, uh, responsible for this uh, developing uh, crisis that we can see uh, of uh, imperialism all around the world. And uh, in the face of this, uh, we see also uh, that uh, imperialism is seeking for uh, an ideological a capacity to defend itself. And many people who call themselves leftists and nationalists and Marxists and a whole bunch of other things, uh, uh, in the uh, wake of uh, imperialism and crisis, uh, uh, will, will offer up uh, uh, solutions uh, and conclusions and worldviews uh, that defend imperialism as opposed to uh, fighting against imperialism. And, and the people, and certainly African working class, need uh, to be equipped. Uh, uh, ideologically need to have a philosophy that can uh, uh, express uh, the aspirations and uh, express uh, uh, and predict the, the victory of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the African revolution over uh, imperialist uh, domination. And that is African internationalism. And I want to say a few things about that uh, moving forward. 
some people have problems uh, with this discussion for a number of reasons. Uh, some people uh, do not like the fact that we in the African People's Socialist Party hold high uh, the theory, the philosophy of African internationalism. Uh, they uh, they uh, resort to things like uh, everybody has an opinion and, and yours can't be right. You're saying you have the only right ideas, et cetera. And this sounds uh, to untrained uh, ears to be a very democratic kind of argument that here you are uh, trying to uh, dictate what everybody should think and everybody has the right to have their own opinions, et cetera. And vulgar uh, opinionism is something that reigns uh, supreme under uh, bourgeois democracy. In fact, that's a democratic right to be wrong. And uh, what we are saying is that there's a scientific approach to how we see the world and how uh, the analysis that we make of the world and that uh, it is critical at a time of uh, a deepening crisis of imperialism that the African working class uh, has the ability to uh, look at the world just as it is because we have as an objective overturning a social system that's responsible for the oppression of everybody and that came into existence uh, in the process of, uh, of uh, c colonial uh, slavery that has deprived African and other oppressed peoples around the world uh, of any kind of meaningful future of our own. I want to remind everybody that uh, all ideas are not equal. And uh, just because one has an idea, uh, you can't say that it falls uh, on the scale of ideas equal to uh, every other idea. <clears throat> so uh, that's what it makes it so important for us to have this discussion, to, to say how uh, we should be looking at and investigating uh, the world. Um, in <clears throat> the political report to the Sixth Congress, and, <clears throat> and um, this is part of my self-criticism in, in many ways, is because every political report that we've ever done is, uh, is based on uh, a worldview uh, informed by dialectical and historical materialism. Uh, anybody who reads uh, the political report uh, comes out of it uh, with uh, dialectical, imperial, uh, dialectical materialist uh, 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 interpretation of phenomenon that of the past and, and what uh, is happening today. Uh, the, the problem is that we have never uh, spent a lot of time talking about philosophy as such. And uh, so therefore people don't necessarily recognize what, what you're reading and talking about uh, as being a product of a historical materialist uh, uh, investigation and analysis. And that's why we want to talk about philosophy now, so that uh, we can see uh, the origin of these ideas. And all ideas are not the same, and all philosophy is not the same. And uh, we look for a scientifically based philosophy. We look for a philosophy that has its uh, origin in a genuine scientific examination uh, and analysis uh, of the world and of history, uh, if you will, the uh, scientific uh, investigation and analysis of the development of human society, if you will, certainly of, uh, of uh, the process that gave rise to the social system that we know as capitalism. Uh, and uh, so we say that what makes it scientific is not just that it's our opinion, but the fact is that it can be falsified. And by falsified, we don't mean that because somebody can prove it wrong. We mean that because somebody can prove it wrong or right. We mean that, uh, uh, that uh, you can look at what we say uh, and then uh, examine it and say that if what we have uh, determined uh, it was necessary to give rise to capitalism or if what we say uh, uh, it offers an explanation of the rise of capitalism uh, 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 is true, then uh, we ought to be able to investigate and see if how things happen, that's the, really what occurred. We ought to be able to look into that. It's not like saying in the beginning there was the word and the word was God, uh, which you can't investigate at all. There's no way you can investigate that. It cannot be falsified. Therefore, you cannot characterize it as scientific. And there, 
we have this. Somebody says, well, uh, we're going to be uh, free because of melanin. We got a lot of melanin, so that's not a scientific explanation of phenomena. It might make one feel good uh, if you got a lot of melanin and bad if you don't have a lot of melanin uh, to say that, but you can't call it scientific because it can't be falsified. You can't say that, or perhaps it can be falsified because if melanin were such an incredible factor, uh, then how can you explain the fact that uh, we uh, were subjected to uh, colonial slavery if that was this all-determining uh, powerful uh, factor? But the point is that African internationalism can be falsified. And um, I just want to uh, just read a couple of things uh, first. And the, this, the difficulty in this discussion, I'd hope to be able to do the two parts on today. I'm not sure if we'll be able to get to all both of these parts, because so much of what we have to do uh, refutes uh, some conclusions that Cornforth himself has come to. Uh, but uh, one would come to different conclusions if one had read uh, the political reports to the uh, fifth, sixth, seventh, and even the uh, uh, the fourth uh, Congress of the African People's Socialist Party and earlier. So uh, <coughs> one thing that we say uh, in uh, uh, Uneasy Equilibrium, which is a political report to the uh, sixth Congress of the African People's Socialist Party, um, uh, just reading from uh, chapter three, uh, which uh, begins on page uh, 59, and I know I didn't alert people uh, to look into that, but that's all right, because we're going to get into Cornforth. I just want to see this as part of the introduction to the discussion uh, and trying to help people understand why we in the African People's Socialist Party uh, pay so much attention to this whole question of philosophy, to this whole question of theory. And also want to say that, uh, this, it, that, that everybody is armed with theory of a certain sort, and most of the African people who we know uh, in our communities, and uh, especially those uh, furthest away from uh, the clutches of the petty bourgeoisie and, 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 and the, uh, the imperialists themselves, but just on every street corner in our communities where people are having to contend with poverty, oppression, brutality, uh, this kind of stuff, they're, this discussion happens. This just doesn't call itself uh, 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 materialism. It doesn't call itself dialectical and what have you, and it's not able uh, generally speaking, to uh, put its, uh, its uh, opinion in some kind of developed philosophical uh, package. But uh, people in the communities are dealing with these very same questions. And so we should not be intimidated by these questions because uh, some of the language is, uh, is uh, different and, and to some extent complicated because it's different. Not because it's complicated, but because it's different and because we have not had access to some of the language and perhaps it's not been necessary for us to have access to the language. But just as uh, uh, people, African people who consider themselves Christians and what have you, uh, certainly those who live uh, 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 in Africa or who live uh, uh, in places outside of uh, what is now referred to as the Middle East, you read the Bible, we come up with all these complicated and different uh, names and, and places that we never heard of before and you just, <clears throat> you just over periods of time of studying them, you come to know the names and, and, the, and you come to know something about the places uh, or certainly know how to pronounce the places even if you don't know anything about the places. I've found that most Christians don't know a damn thing about what they refer to as Christianity, but they know how to say the words and uh, et cetera. They learn that. So I'm just saying that uh, these are, we will look at a different, uh, uh, a different kind of language, even though it's in English. But the, these uh, so-called philosophers and, and intellectuals, they learn how to speak a different language. That's one of the things that set them apart, sets them apart from uh, the rest of the people, and especially the French theorists, the French philosophers, uh, et cetera. Uh, and, and you know, Marx was akin to those. They create their own complicated kind of language, and that's part of what we run into in the part of this discussion. And it doesn't have to be a complicated language. It can be ordinary <coughs> white people's English that we're looking at, <coughs> or a white people's French, or white people's Spanish, or Portuguese that we're looking at <coughs> that can make uh, it uh, appear complicated because it's so removed uh, from uh, ordinary people's lives, certainly in, in, the, in, the, in its production, uh, in its distribution, in its development, in its, in its discourse. It's not the way that ordinary people talk about things. And so sometimes people uh, would even refuse to take a course in philosophy when you go to school, philosophy. 
I mean, the, the, the discussion, uh, it seems to be uh, based on absurdities, you know, does a, <coughs> that, uh, does a, a tree uh, make a sound uh, and when it falls in the forest if there's no one to hear it, or uh, the sound of one hand clapping and stuff like this. I mean, that's so absurd that most people wouldn't want to spend a day or an hour <coughs> you know, having some discussions that seem to revolve around inert, uh, uh, <coughs> such uh, absurdities and inanities. Uh, but we're seeing that uh, almost everything that we see and almost everything we, we do uh, 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 is informed uh, in the real world by some uh, outlook, some worldview. And that uh, usually the worldview that most of us uh, <coughs> are encumbered with uh, is the worldview of the oppressing classes, the oppressor classes. Those are the ones and with all the resources, all the power. They control the universities. They <coughs> control the thinking uh, sectors of the population whom they thought to t think and who produce uh, ideas and distribute ideas based on the interests of those who rule. And uh, if you have access to uh, certain ideas and uh, 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 et cetera, generally speaking, it's because uh, uh, that access has been made available to you by the bourgeoisie because it's permissible uh, and because it uh, con contains the elements of our oppression and exploitation, which is why uh, we cannot boost this with Facebook, which is why in the middle of certain discussions that people who uh, are just ordinary folk are trying to express uh, our worldview and how white power uh, impacts on us, find that we, 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 we are cut off by Facebook, we are left out of the discussion because the bourgeoisie, the ruling, the thinking representatives of the bourgeoisie are those who control uh, uh, ideas, their production, their distribution, and the African working class, generally speaking, does not have access to that. That's why the African working class has, for the first time uh, 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 in its history, its own revolutionary political party uh, that uh, has the responsibility uh, for developing, for producing and distributing, distributing uh, these uh, revolutionary ideas, revolutionary philosophy, a way to apprehend the world uh, that's different from that of the bourgeoisie. So I want to just uh, share this before going to corn forth. <clears throat> this is uh, from the political report uh, to uh, the Sixth Congress of the African People's Socialist Party. And it's just a basic uh, <clears throat> uh, description on page 66. It says that uh, um, for us, the rise of capitalism uh, in the world is not based on some purely abstract Marxist theory about the development of human society. It is not a theoretical question. Primitive accumulation, which is what Marx uh, uh, ascribed to uh, the emergence, the advent, the development of capitalism itself, primitive accumulation is not a theory. Uh, the rape of Africa, the enslavement of our continent and our people, the forcible dispersal of Africans throughout the world as a means of rescuing Europe from disease and poverty, the process that gave rise to capitalism is a matter of historical record. So, <clears throat> you know, the Marxists and, and, and European philosophers and those who've fallen under the sway of the Marxists and European philosophers who uh, are in this position, the Marxists and European philosophers are describing the reality of peoples in the world uh, as observers, uh, not as people who are making that history or part of that history we come to different kinds of conclusions. That's fundamentally what it is that we're seeing. And that uh, Marx, the spectator, did not have to understand this. The person sitting on the hot stove, the living, breathing, thinking, quote unquote, primitive accumulation is what we were described as, would either understand this question or perish. Uh, we chose to understand more than that. We chose to develop a worldview stemming from this understanding. This is the origin of African internationalism. So we have to understand this reality that we are confronted with. Uh, the Marxists didn't have to understand this. Karl Marx did not have to understand this world. In fact, uh, it's an interesting kind of, I guess one characterizes it as irony, that uh, <clears throat> Marx, who you know, experienced uh, you know, severe uh, deprivation uh, while uh, writing Capital and much of uh, the theory 
uh, that people refer to as Marxism uh, uh, was, uh, was supported uh, uh, financially primarily by his, his friend and collaborator, Frederick Engels, <coughs> and, uh, uh, who actually organized uh, uh, and copy edited and organized much of uh, uh, the, the work capital. Uh, but Engels uh, got his money from his father, who was, uh, who was a, a sector of the bourgeoisie, the white ruling class. And his father got his money, uh, uh, much of his money, from a cotton that was being picked by African people who were enslaved uh, in Mississippi and Alabama, et cetera. So here Marx is, uh, as uncomfortable as he may have been, uh, sitting on the pedestal of slavery and what have you, writing about the end of capital, uh, and who actually talks in his works about uh, the, uh, 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 what he referred to as wage slavery uh, in, 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 the new, in Europe, uh, requiring as a pedestal slavery pure and simple uh, in, the, in the new world. He's our slavery. He's saying that the slavery, that, uh, the, that the wage slavery, which is an interesting characterization of people who had jobs in Europe, uh, uh, rested on a pedestal of slavery, pure and simple in the New World. And here's Marx sitting on that pedestal, uh, supplied directly by Frederick Engels, uh, whose father gave him money from, uh, that came from black people picking cotton in Mississippi. Here he is writing about uh, the capital and the rise of capitalism and how capitalism would be destroyed. And while writing this, he never says that capitalism should be destroyed by kicking that pedestal uh, upon which all capitalist uh, activity uh, rests, he never says the way we get out of this is kick the pedestal out. Because if you kick the pedestal out, Marx can't write his book. And uh, this, is a, this is a phenomenal contradiction that we're looking at uh, by people who refer to themselves as Marxists and, you know, uh, et cetera. I don't know, I hope that was re relatively clear. But anyway, we say that uh, African internationalism uh, is simply the worldview stemming from a historical materialist investigation and analysis of the world, with the starting point being the experience and role of Africans in Africa in the advent of capitalist imperialism as the rise of white power. Parasitic capitalism is the real issue. Parasitic capitalism is the real issue. It is this reality that ultimately distinguishes African internationalist socialism from the struggle for white rights that usually characterizes most movements of Europeans worldwide. It is the difference in socialism resulting from overturning the pedestal upon which all capitalist activity occurs and some variation of the national socialism achieved by the infamous Nazis of Germany. Uh, so I wanted to uh, just make that statement and um, uh, because I, uh, it is something that we will see that distinguishes what we are talking about here uh, from uh, some of what we see uh, from Cornforth, and I think it helps us to understand uh, 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 Cornforth uh, uh, also. Uh, so, uh, uh, we, f we say uh, uh, further, and um, that the science of African internationalism enable our party to avoid the ideological pitfalls that validate the assumption of the superiority of white people. Thus, we have never been uh, diverted from our mission of capturing power and uniting Africa and our nation under the leadership of the African working class. Our party brought science to our defeated African liberation movement at a time when it was generally bogged down uh, in racial and cultural nationalism that indulge in candlelit ceremonies, religious obscurantism, and nostalgia for an often imaginary African past. Through African internationalism, we were able to discover the material basis uh, for the exploitation and oppression of Africans and others in the world. Through African internationalism, we were able to discover the material basis for the exploitation and oppression of Africans and others in the world. And when we say material basis here, uh, we are dealing with this whole question of the difference in materialism versus idealism. Uh, because there are idealistic bases given to our condition and how things happen in the world. And we say African internationalism uh, uh, exposes the material basis for this oppression, this relationship. 
And it's not melanin deficit or uh, uh, too much thereof. Uh, uh, and it's not that we don't pray to the right gods and other things like that. There is a material basis for that, and African internationalism helps us to get there. And we say with African internationalism, we can understand the material forces that work in the movement of history, that there are material forces that work in the movement of history. We can clearly see the current shift in the balance of power between the oppressor and the oppressed between Europe and the rest of us, between the so-called white man and the so-called black man. We can use uh, this uh, uh, African internationalism, this means of investigating and ana analyzing uh, the world that when applied to society is referred to as historical materialism. We can use this uh, to understand uh, these questions. Um, so, and that's why we're not racist, because we learned a long time ago that fighting against racism uh, is simply, uh, uh, it's a self-defeating waste of time because racism is the ideological foundation of capitalist imperialism. Uh, racism is a concept that de denies Africans our national identity and dignity rather than defining the system of our oppression. Racism doesn't do that. I don't care how much, you can say it over and over again. You can. Uh, have groups of people, 10,000, 50,000 people stand out in front of the Uhura House and go racism, 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 and it doesn't change the fact uh, that there's a material basis for the conditions that we experience. And it's not the ideas in anybody's head. The ideas in anybody's head uh, is significant only because it can impact materially uh, on us. And it can impact materially on us because somebody else has the power to do something to us and we don't have the power uh, to uh, defend ourselves or we don't have the power to carry out uh, our own will and our own interests as a people. Um, and then uh, finally on page 61, uh, the material conditions Africans suffer worldwide have their origin in the attack on Africa that led to the capture of our national homeland and our people. The material conditions, uh, I'm not talking about the absence of the right religion or anything, the material conditions that Africa suffer worldwide have their origin in the attack on Africa that led to the capture of our national homeland and our people. Our poverty and susceptibility to ignorance, violence, and material want throughout the world, including in the U.S., the U.K., and the rest of Europe, result uh, from the material conditions of existence in Africa since its capture and partition. So everywhere we are in the world, I mean, Africa came under assault. This is the beginning of this process. Africa came under assault. That's why we are uh, right now sitting up uh, uh, on West Fer Florissant uh, in St. Louis, just down the street from uh, Florence and, uh, uh, and Canfield Drive, where Mike Brown was killed five years ago. We are here uh, because of this assault on Africa. That's why Africa is divided into these untenable entities on the continent itself. Uh, that's why people are talking about reparations. Uh, uh, black people are talking about reparations uh, in the Caribbean, uh, in, in the Amer throughout the Americas, in this country, and on the continent of Africa itself. Because the origin of every contradiction that we experience in the world uh, is in the assault that was made on Africa that made Europe rich and the rest of us poor, and we carried with us to these places we brought with us, uh, to these places where we've been for forcibly dispersed, uh, the uh, fundamental contradiction that initiated with the attack on Africa itself. So, um, so uh, I just wanted to, to, to uh, share that. Uh, and then uh, I do want to... Uh, uh, to say that this emphasis uh, on African internationalism uh, um, uh, is necess necessitates uh, a discussion on dialectic and historical materialism, uh, looking at the scientific method of investigating and analyzing uh, that led to African internationalist worldview. Um, and so that's what we want to say. And then we can't uh, go much uh, further in this discussion without acknowledging that yesterday uh, was the birth uh, day of uh, Marcus Garvey, uh, who played such a fundamental role uh, in actually uh, taking us beyond just some philosophical discussion uh, into the actual struggle uh, to accomplish the total uh, liberation and unification of African and African people around the world whose mission 
was summed up and the mission that uh, was uh, uh, given to African people worldwide uh, as recent as 1920 uh, uh, was Africa for Africans at home and abroad. And that was the essential definition of the task uh, before us that really uh, spoke to the contradictions. And of course, Garvey and Garveyism has been under assault uh, uh, from, the, from its very inception, you know, by people who had a, a closer relationship or desired a closer relationship with imperialism than with Africa and African people ourselves, who uh, had no faith in the ability of African Africans to achieve uh, the future that we uh, wanted, independent of a relationship with imperialist white power. So uh, I'm going to begin uh, now on uh, Cornforth, uh, with Cornforth's work. And I said it offers us a framework to hold this discussion because it allows us entry uh, into the discussion of uh, philosophy. You see, it's possible to have a discussion on dialectic and historical materialism uh, without giving much attention to the issue of philosophy itself. Uh, so you can speak of dialectical and, uh, and historical materialism uh, uh, and the method of investigation and analysis without uh, getting uh, to uh, the philosophy, or you can get to the philosophy that, uh, say, uh, Cornforth and people who refer to themselves as Marxists would have you come to. It robs one of the ability to come to independent analysis, and that's what we have a responsibility to do here. So we're going to look at Cornforth. And he, right now, uh, as you know, uh, we started this discussion dealing with the question, uh, first of all, of materialism and idealism and showing that uh, they each owe, owes, uh, that is to say, materialism and idealism, each owes uh, uh, its definition uh, as uh, opposites uh, to each other. So there's a materialist uh, way of uh, perceiving the world and an idealist way of perceiving uh, the world. And so we went through that. And then we say that now we had this place uh, where we said that there's such a thing as a mechanistic materialism. And when we look at mechanistic materialism, we're going to say, uh, I can say right now, the thing about mechanistic materialism is that it's different from what we get to when we talk about dialectical materialism. Mechanistic materialism. Uh, uh, gives us uh, what might be uh, characterized as a, uh, well, it's a non-dialectical approach. Let me just put it that way. It doesn't necessarily uh, recognize uh, phenomenon and society itself as something that's uh, in a state of, of constantly coming into existence and going uh, out of existence in a state of this relationship with all other things. There's a thing called mechanistic materialism. And... Uh, uh, <laughs> And the thing is that when we even look at the, the, uh, how uh, this, uh, this chapter is introduced uh, by, by Cornforth, it reads, uh, the type of materialism produced in the past uh, by the revolutionary bourgeoisie was mechanistic materialism. And, I, and, and you know, this is part of what makes this discussion relatively complicated, because he talks about the revolutionary bourgeoisie. And the bourgeoisie, uh, and this is a discussion that has its basis mostly in the description of uh, uh, European phenomena, social uh, political phenomenon. And uh, it's only uh, your only ability that you can have uh, uh, to talk about the revolutionary bourgeoisie was as it pertained simply to, uh, to Europe. Uh, you can say that the bourgeoisie was revolutionary because it uh, overthrew feudalism. And in Europe, feudalism uh, was backwards. Uh, it uh, was, uh, the philosophy was uh, basic Catholic philosophy. Uh, it was, uh, economics uh, system was one that uh, where uh, the nobility, the landlords owned all the land and things like that and restricted the movement of uh, uh, ordinary people uh, who were serfs. And you had this contest between the, uh, the nobility and the serfs, where the serfs worked uh, for the nobility on the land uh, if the nobility sold the land, if the landlord sold the land, then they went with the land. Uh, and then uh, uh, they only kept the pittance of what it was that they owned. This has led to uh, mythological uh, characters like Robin Hood, you know, in England, uh, et cetera. So he's talking about this. If you compare uh, the way that the, the European uh, uh, toilers existed prior to uh, capitalism, then you can say the advent of capitalism in Europe was really progressive 
because it overturned that relationship. It freed up the uh, peasants, uh, the serfs, uh, from being tied to the land, and now they can keep part of what they did, more of what they earned. They can go out and sell their labor power to the highest bidder, etc. Uh, so you can say, wow, that is progressive. But uh, you can only say that uh, if you liquidate the fact that the European bourgeoisie capitalism itself had its origin in enslaving the rest of us. So here you got European workers and people in Europe, amazing transformation of Europe. But how did it come about? It came about through slavery and colonialism. So you call it progressive only as it relates to the relationship that white people and Europeans have with each other. As it relates to the relationship that uh, Europe had to the rest of us, it was the most uh, reactionary uh, thing because it pushed the rest of us backwards in history while it elevated uh, European and, uh, and uh, 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 up to this other place. And this is where you find the advent of capitalism, right? And so, so you have the advent of capitalism, and this is one of the disagreements we have with Lenin. Because Lenin would characterize uh, what he called imperialism uh, as uh, uh, the highest expression of capitalism. Capitalism developed you know, to its highest uh, extent. Capitalism has become rotten ripe uh, in its development. Uh, but uh, that, uh, in many ways, obscures the relationship that we have because the word imperialism is derived from the word empire. And empire is what we encountered first. It was the empire uh, that sent the slavers, that sent the so-called uh, uh, explorers, which were slavers, uh, land th thieves, and stuff like that throughout the world. It was they that uh, captured Africans, brought, a, uh, uh, brought us into slavery, that captured uh, lands uh, uh, in the Americas, and that's now called Americas and other places, that transformed uh, 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 Europe uh, and transformed uh, our relationship uh, to the rest of the world. So uh, this uh, phenomenon of the emergence of this uh, progressive, uh, uh, you know, uh, this historically progressive uh, uh, feature in, in, in history uh, is, is belied by the reality that is imposed on the rest of us. And so when Lenin talked about capitalism being uh, uh, imperialism developed to its highest uh, extent, we said no. Imp uh, we say that uh, uh, when he says that imperialism is capitalism developed uh, uh, to its highest uh, extent, we say no, capitalism is imperialism developed to its highest extent. Capitalism was derived from imperialism. And if we look at the empire coming to Africa and going to all these other places and capturing and bringing all these tremendous resources that transform Europe, and then in the process of doing that, transform the relationship that Europe had to the rest of us, and in fact created a whole new world, uh, uh, then we see that it was not imperialism born of capitalism, but it was capitalism born of empire and imperialism. You see, and that's a whole different approach that you end up having to attacking these contradictions and why uh, the Marxists have never, ever, ever, ever been able uh, to deal with this. Even when you look at some forces who call themselves Marxists, Ho Chi Minh, who was supposed to be a Marxist, he said that you're looking for imperialism when you look, and he was a co-founder, Ho Chi Minh, of the French Communist Party. He said, uh, one of the issues he was saying, he said, you're looking for imperialism. When you look inside Europe for imperialism, you're only looking at the tail. He said the head of, of imperialism is in the colonies. And even Mao Zedong, who was considered a Marxist, but that's why you have to have Mao Zedong, Marxist thought, I mean Marxist Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, because Mao has to solve this problem uh, that did not come as a consequence of the industrialization of, of, of the, uh, uh, the growth of the uh, industrial capacity of China, uh, but was based on the, uh, the, the peasantry, who was the primary uh, social force there, and broke all the rules that the Marxists had said were necessary uh, to have revolution. Um, what I'm saying is that, and then if you look at Cuba, uh, as another example, uh, the, the Cuban revolutionaries, even though Che and, and Fidel call themselves Marxists and what have you, they had to fight the Communist Party in Cuba uh, in order to move this revolutionary project forward because they had to go against what were uh, 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 these um, ossified uh, ideas uh, that came from Mar And Lenin himself had to defy a basic Marxist understanding because according to Marx, uh, that uh, uh, that uh, capitalism, uh, that communism would uh, not come uh, in a place like Russia, 
uh, that uh, itself was uh, a sort of a, a, a feudal, semi-feudal uh, entity that was just uh, uh, where capitalism was just beginning to emerge, uh, according to Marx, that you can only have uh, communism uh, at the, uh, as a consequence of the development of, uh, of, uh, of the capitalism itself. And so uh, many people who were part of Lenin's, or Lenin's organization, including members of the Central Committee, uh, refused to make the revolution, refused to take power when it was possible because they said, according to Marx, that you have to go through capitalism before you can get to communism. You with me on that? This is objective truth. And uh, so anyway, uh, so we, we say that uh, uh, the type of materialism produced in the past by the revolutionary bourgeoisie was mechanistic materialism. This took over the ancient materialist concept conception that the world consisted of unchanging material atoms whose interactions produced all the phenomena of nature and further strove to understand the workings of nature on the model of the workings of a machine. This is what, the, what was characterized as progressive uh, uh, revolutionary bourgeoisie. This is how they, they, they saw uh, materialism. They were materialists, but they were me mechanistic materialists. Uh, it was in, a, in its time of progressive and revolutionary doctrine. Uh, it was in its time, that is to say mechanistic materialism, it was in its time, and this is Europe, a progressive and revolutionary doctrine, but it has three grave weaknesses. One, it requires the conception of a supreme being who started the world up. Two, it seeks to reduce all processes to the same cycle of mechanistic interactions and so cannot account for development uh, for the emergence of new qualities. Uh, new types of processes in nature, and three, it cannot account for social development, can give no account of human social activity and leads to an abstract conception of human nature. So this is the weakness that, uh, that uh, Cornforth is recognizing about mechanistic materialism. He said that it was positive because it, it uh, progressive in its era, and uh, it makes the assumption that uh, uh, really that is, it was phenomenal. Um, and, but it was phenomenal to Europe, and this is what you really got to understand, because people could not have built the pyramids without an understanding of dialectics and materialism. They, you couldn't pray them pyramids up there. You couldn't pray them rocks up there. You couldn't, uh, and the Dogon uh, people who studied the universe and uh, understood, uh, 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 you know, placement of stars and where they were located, you know, for thousands of years. It took thousands of years to do this, and it took an element of science uh, to make that kind of stuff happen. If you look at even what the people who they referred to, uh, the, who have been now being characterized, uh, 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 how do we characterize the, where they found uh, these uh, huge uh, stone uh, heads uh, in Mexico, uh, 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 the Olmeca, if you look at that, I mean, they still can't say how the Olmeca got those hairs that weighed tons uh, from the location, which were hundreds of miles away from where they were built. How the hell did they get them there? They still can't say that. That took science. That took uh, some understanding of dialectics and materialism. Again, they didn't pray those things up. They made those things happen. In fact, where we saw idealism come into play was when Europeans had to begin to describe what they saw there, and they didn't want it to be attributable to black people. And so they said, well, uh, the reason they look like they're from black people is because uh, in the, when they were created, they, they had tools that were so crude uh, that they couldn't uh, create the finely chiseled features of white people, or because of, in the hundreds of years that they were there, the wind just sort of made them look like black people, uh, uh, et cetera. This is, this is where you see idealism coming for, uh, forward. And this was idealism that was coming for the people who, from that time, where we're talking about uh, Europe had made this great uh, leap in terms of uh, being able to deal with complex questions and ideas and mechanistic materialism and how it was such an improvement. No, they still, uh, you, they still rested upon this pedestal, and they need to have an explanation even of that that liquidated the role that Africans and other people played in history. So this is what distorts this discussion considerably. And, uh, and so I'm trying to get to um, much of what Cornforth said, but even in the introduction of this discussion, you can see what it is that we're running into. And if you go to places like India 
And there's a reference to India here, too, that's really interesting and striking. Uh, but you look at the rest of the world, Europe was new uh, to science and to uh, uh, much of what it is that we're talking about, uh, that's, uh, that the Marxists attribute uh, to uh, necessary developments in society uh, 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 to occur. Europe was new to this, but they, they uh, you, when you look at, uh, and, but they, but we want to attribute uh, the uh, science and things like that to Europe, uh, which, you know, the reality, and I've, I've said it over and over again, that Africans <laughs> were building pyramids before Europeans mastered fire. So obviously, you know, you can't be looking at the origin of science in Europe uh, as much of what happens, it's, it's inferred in much of what it is that we see and what we read. Uh, so we say that, um, but it is true that uh, the weakness of a mechanistic uh, materialist approach, and I'm not sure that mechanistic materialism uh, was something that you could, uh, you know, apply to all peoples in every place, uh, because it seems to me that if you look at a lot of uh, how we understand uh, philosophy and world, and we do understand some things about philosophy, uh, uh, regardless of how we perceive of it. Uh, the indigenous peoples in various places that talk about Mother Earth, uh, the relationships that, you know, uh, all uh, things on the planet have to each other, etc. That's a dialectical explanation uh, that we're looking at. Uh, and we may not agree with some of the conclusions they came to, but we see uh, dialectics at work here. And I think that it's uh, hard to um, uh, enjoy uh, the description of dialectic and historical materialism put forth by Cornforth and other people who refer to themselves as Marxists if Europe is the only uh, uh, template that we use to understand the movement of history. And that is the template that Marx uses. That's the template when Marx talks about uh, the uh, development of human society uh, and he comes up with uh, different modes of production in human society uh, uh, what he is talking about essentially is the development of European society and he attributes uh, European society or he uh, as, as that of human society. So uh, anyway, which limits his, his worldview, limits his capacity to, to understand the world and that's problematic. Okay, uh, so we say that uh, again, uh, you talk about the three grave weaknesses of uh, mechanistic materialism. It requires the conception of a supreme being who started the world up. It seeks to reduce all processes to the same cycle of mechanistic interactions and so on that cannot, uh, cannot account for development, uh, for the emergence of new qualities, new types of processes in nature. Three, it cannot account for social development, can give no account of human social activity and leads uh, to an abstract conception of human nature. Uh, <clears throat> the changing world and how to understand it. Uh, before Marx, materialism was pre predominantly me mechanistic, and then I would add in Europe. Um, we often hear people complain that the materialists seek to reduce everything in the world, including uh, life and, and mind, to a system of soulless mechanism, uh, to a, a mere mechanical interaction of bodies. This refers uh, to mechanistic materialism. So we say, people will say that about materialists, but what they're really talking about is mechanistic materialism when they say this. Marxist materialism is, however, not mechanistic, but dialectic. Uh, we'll see that, dialectical. To understand what this means, we need to understand something about mechanistic materialism itself. Uh, we can approach this problem by asking how materialists have uh, sought to understand the various processes of change which are observed everywhere in the world. The world is full of change. Night follows day and day night. The seasons succeed each other. People are born, grow old, and die. Every philosophy recognizes that change is an omnipresent fact. The question is, how are we to understand the change which we observe everywhere? And this is what has the bourgeoisie today stymied, uh, locked in, uh, and all, most of the Marxists and everywhere, the whole a world that is informed by European philosophy is stymied today. How the hell do we understand uh, the change which we are observing everywhere? And we see it everywhere, don't we? We see fantastic critical tr uh, changes happening everywhere in the world, all over the world, talking permanent warfare, trying to do what? Stop this change. And then it can't stop the change because 
uh, it is a part of the change. Uh, that is to say, Europe, when we see splits and divisions and all kinds of things happening everywhere. Change may be understood in the first place in an idealist way or in a materialist way. Idealism trace back, traces back all change uh, to some idea or intention. If not human, then divine. For thus, for idealism, changes in the material world are, in the last analysis, uh, initiated and brought about by something outside matter, not material, but subject to the laws, uh, uh, not subject to the laws of the material world. And, but materialism traces back all change to material causes. In other words, it seeks to explain what happens in the material world from the material world itself. Uh, but while the occurrences of change has been recognized by everyone since no one can, none can ignore it, philosophers have nevertheless sought to find something which does not change, something permanent, something changeless behind or within the change. Uh, this is generally an essential part of the ideology of the exploiting class. They are afraid of change because they are afraid that they too may be swept away. So they always seek for something fixed and stable, not subject to change. They try to hitch themselves onto this, uh, as it were. And uh, I'm struck here uh, by uh, Marx's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, concept of the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the development of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, human society, uh, this Marxist concept of, uh, of development. And I'm, con I'm struck here by how Marx uh, wiggles uh, with the question of the movement uh, from feudalism that we've just talked about. Remember feudalism? That's the time, the Robin Hood, when people are trapped on the land and they can't you know, do anything except for uh, permission from the landlord, uh, etc., uh, and Marx up to now, and and dialectics teaches us up to now uh, that you understand uh, the change and uh, what certainly transformation in the world, uh, not because of some outside factor primarily, but because of internal contradictions, right? And so here's Marx now. Uh, he wants to uh, explain the movement from feudalism, from Robin Hood, and you will, to capitalism. And, and what he says uh, is that there's this interesting phenomena comes from the outside. He's, uh, and this outside is what he characterizes primitive accumulation. He mixes primitive accumulation. He says, he says this primitive accumulation is what? Is, to, is turning Africa into a warring for the commercial hunting of black skins. He talked about primitive accumulation coming from uh, the uh, uh, European uh, attack on China, uh, that, uh, the British Opium War that brought all this wealth, et cetera, to England. And he could have he gone further, couldn't he? He could have talked about the French and how France uh, uh, extorted all kinds of uh, resources from opium. He could have gone even further than that. He could have said how what we call America and the Americas themselves constituted a part of the primitive accumulation that went to the wealth uh, of Europe. He could have said all those things, right? But the problem that we have, now, but then he says, he, he mixes up uh, as primitive accumulation that the, the, um, uh, the, the land, what do they call it in Europe, where they, uh, the European uh, uh, tenants were pushed off the land and what have you. Uh, uh, and he called this primitive accumulation too, but that's absolute land enclosure acts. That's absolutely wrong. You can't mix them up as the same because there were land enclosure acts because the capitalist now needs to the, the free up the, the people, the peasants on the land so that they can, produce, they can participate in the expropriate uh, dealing with the value uh, and the resources being stolen from Africa and other places around the world. One of them is primitive accumulation. One of them. This is the outside factor that Cornforth says you can't that mechanistic materialism requires. Are you with me? This is the outside factor. He's saying already that you can't attribute change to some outside factor that it's the contradictions inside the thing that is responsible for development. But that's not what Marx, Marx when he comes up with primitive accumulation. It's this mysterious kind of thing. It is the equivalent when you're looking at uh, uh, the development of, uh, of uh, of feudalism to capitalism, it is the equivalent of what Marx referred to 
uh, as uh, uh, what you call the fetish of the commodity. Uh, you know, the, the commodity, the commodity that loses um, uh, uh, its, its, its um, character, that this, this character is disguised and, and what have you, uh, the commodity is something that's produced uh, for the market, for sale. And so there's the fetish of the commodity, that the commodity becomes everything. It's almost like magic. It's almost like superstition. You know, like you go to the store and, and, and you buy a, a quart of milk, uh, you don't rent the cow. In fact, the cows disappear. There's some people who don't even necessarily know milk comes from cows who live uh, in some of the so-called industrialized countries. This is the fetish of the commodity. And now we're looking at what might be characterized as the fetish of primitive accumulation that now uh, makes the white worker in Europe uh, all this that's responsible for production and development and adding value to everything on the one hand, that it liquidates the role that's being played by the African in the bauxite mines, uh, whether in, in, in West Africa or in uh, South America, uh, that created, uh, that drug up the bauxite, that went on to uh, the, uh, the production of aluminum that you see on your cars today. They are not even factors uh, of significance. And so this is the fetish of the primitive accumulation. So this is how Marx uh, was able uh, to talk about uh, the, uh, uh, how uh, the, uh, the uh, slavery, uh, in, in wage slavery in Europe uh, required as a pedestal slavery, pure and simple, uh, uh, in the New World on the one hand, but did not factor into the slavery in the new world into the equation of how to overthrow capitalism. You with me? Who, who then has the responsibility of doing that? The slaves in the new world, right? <laughs> or those who have been affected by what he characterized as the slavery in the new world. We have to do that. They don't have to do that. They don't have to come up with a, a solution to that damn problem. They don't have to uh, do that. They come up with, instead uh, with solutions that uh, guarantees the permanence of the white thing. And Marx did that uh, when he, because uh, he, he, he did not necessarily guarantee the permanence or try to, get, try to guarantee the permanence of capital or capitalism. But when you make this outside factor uh, and, and then liquidate it, uh, the basis of the contradiction, and then say that the way you solve it is not by recognizing what just happened here primarily, that is to say, uh, slavery pure and simple, but making the primary issue uh, the contradiction that arises from the slavery pure and simple. You with me on that? Yeah. Yeah. That's really important, comrades. Uh, that's really important in terms of how we interpret the world. This is, yeah. Um, and if I got more sleep last night, I'd be able to say a little more about that um, more effectively. Uh, uh, but I, it's really uh, important, you know, like uh, this question of fear is not a small thing. The philosophy is not a small thing because uh, everything we see around the world that's, that's, that we are dealing with is, is informed by some philosophy and, uh, you know, uh, everything. So let's see. So we say idealism traces... Um, Change may be understood in the first place in an idealist way or in a materialist way. Um, uh, idealism traces back all change to some idea or intention. If not human, then divine. Thus, for idealism, changes in the material world are in the last analysis initiated and brought about by something outside matter, not material, not subject to the laws of the material world. And uh, this is why we find uh, so much of exceptional stuff, you know, like, uh, like uh, the, the uh, development of human si uh, society uh, from the lower to the higher, as, as the Marxists would put it, from uh, 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 primitive communism uh, to, uh, uh, to the real McCoy uh, occurs as a consequence of the contradictions inherent inside those things. Uh, that's how it happens. But at the moment you uh, add this other factor to it, uh, you either function as a mechanistic uh, materialist or as an idealist. And uh, I can tell you what the problem with, with the Marxist thing is. It's not, 
it, the problem is the inability, as we will see when we talk more and more about dialectics, and I think even as we move forward here, is that Marx could not see the development of a whole new process. See, you're not looking at just simple, different, uh, they, you know, you talk about a Thomanistic uh, approach to things that comes with the, uh, the emergence of capital, uh, just all these atoms out there separated, you know, acting on their own. Uh, uh, and that's some of that, that, that philosophical legacy is carried over into Marx, Marxism itself, into Marx, uh, because uh, he was not able to effectively recognize uh, that when you had this collision, and we'll look at this, when we look here about dialectics and, and uh, uh, I think, uh, chemical uh, transformation, that uh, when you know, one chemical over here means one thing, and not over here it means another thing, but when they collide, then you have an entirely different process at work. Do you understand? And the thing is that when you have the collision of, of Europe uh, uh, and Africa, you don't have just these different entities acting individually, uh, casually uh, from each other. You got a whole new, you got a whole new process that has emerged. And if you can't see the whole new process, then you can't understand the dynamics that's at work there, and you can't understand where the real fault line is. It's not in this thing uh, with the working class versus the bourgeoisie sitting on the pedestal. The new fault line is this contradiction existing between the pedestal uh, uh, and uh, the capitalist system itself. You understand? Yeah, yeah. And you can't see that because you have a stake, whether recognized or not, in the ongoing uh, system of sorts. It might not be the capitalist system, but you have a stake in Europe. You have a, I mean, uh, Marx uh, had a, I think, a, a brother-in-law who uh, uh, fought uh, on the, with the, for the Confederates in the United States. Uh, you know, uh, and, you know, I mean, they had an attachment. And it's an objective, real attachment that affects how you view the world. He had an attachment to, to capitalism. That's how, if he couldn't have produced the damn um, uh, capital without resources that's come from uh, capitalism uh, that was produced by Africans who were enslaved. There's no place in his books where he says, I'm right, sitting down here writing in the, in the library in, in London because black people are in the, in picking cotton and being uh, forced to live under the most atrocious circumstances. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say anything like that. It's my responsibility to say that, and not because I'm picking on Marx. And some people say, well, Marx is a racist. I don't even know what the hell that means. I don't even want to get involved in that kind of debate. I'm talking now about the objective relationship that we have with each other and uh, how people come to certain consciousness that, that uh, Marx was right when he said it's not the, uh, uh, the consciousness of men that determine uh, uh, their conditions or something to that effect, but it's the conditions that can determine their consciousness. Um, so, uh, so uh, but materialism traces back all change to material causes. In other words, it seeks to explain what happens in the material world from the material world itself. What happens? We ex that's what materialists uh, attempt to do. And materialism attempts uh, to explain uh, what happens in the material world from the material world itself. And you can't just say uh, this is how capitalism came about and then put as a footnote uh, the, uh, the uh, whole thing about uh, turning Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting of black skins. You can't make that a footnote. You know, this, 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 in fact, he went so far as to say that this primitive accumulation is, uh, in political economy, the equivalence of original sin in theology. That's a profound statement. This, this primitive accumulation is, in, in economics uh, theory, uh, the, the equivalent of, uh, of uh, original sin in theology. That's a profound statement. And it seems to me that's what the whole book should be based on. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> Everything else flows from that reality. But while the occurrence of change has been recognized by everyone since none can ignore it, Philosophers have nevertheless sought to find something which does not change, something permanent, something changeless be behind or within the change, and that's Europe, in this case, Europe. 
that sits on the pedestal does not change. This is an un the unchanging factor. This is generally an essential part of the ideology of an exploiting class. They are afraid of change because they are afraid that they too may be swept away. So Marx wasn't afraid of the change of the working class taking power over the bourgeoisie, but we're saying that the real class question is located in the colonial contradiction. Now, that colonial contradiction means that the colonized now overturn the whole damn thing and uh, take back the resources that belong to us in order to live, et cetera. That's the death of capitalism. But it's also the death of what Europe has become on the backs of the oppressed peoples around the world, and Marx had a stake in that. That, that his stake uh, did not deny the, uh, the, the possibility of the workers to take power, but his, and in fact, he engaged in serious struggle against what he called nationalism. Uh, but the nationalism he was talking about was how it represented itself in, the, in, in Europe. This was contradictions in Europe that he was talking about. He, he wasn't talking about the white nationalism uh, that uh, came into uh, existence, or Europe itself was a white nationalist uh, a creature, a creature uh, that came into existence, that defined itself. Europe got its definition uh, from, uh, became Europe. Uh, through slavery and colonialism. There was no Europe before slavery and colonialism, so it's a white nationalism that we're looking at. So you got left white nationalists and right white nationalists. You know? You have fascist white nationalists and democratic white nationalists. All of them protect and fight for white nationalism, every one of them. So, uh, I'm trying to watch the time. I know some people are saying that's belated uh, exercise. Okay, so uh, I was saying this is gonna be one of the problems going through this, this my corn four, which is why I have to uh, do this. And, and the comrades I've been working with uh, who've been pushing me to write a couple of particularly important things in the writers and workers team, I think they're going to have to play a role uh, in this because, you know, we can go and, and research a lot of different stuff that helps us to understand um, this whole question a lot better than going forth, and we can make it a simple uh, exposition because Africans and other people need to be able to see ourselves in this don't have to, shouldn't have to go off on these, you know, side bars and stuff like that to locate ourselves. You know, we need to be able to see ourselves in this discussion because we are central to the question. We are central to the question. Uh, but that's what we mean in part how for the last period, the longest period of time, Europeans have been the subjects of history and Africans have simply been the objects of history uh, because we've been pushed out of history. That's part of what I think Cabral must have meant. Uh, when you talk about, uh, you know, the liberation movement being uh, struggled to uh, thrust ourselves back into history. That's what, part of what it is that we are doing, you know. Um, and this is different, by the way, and I want to be clear on that. This is different uh, from uh, the school uh, that puts itself, this economic school that characterizes itself as the school of underdevelopment. Uh, this is a, 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 a school that included people like Walter Rodney and Samir Amin, uh, Gunda Frank, and other people like that, who, who recognized what they call underdevelopment uh, uh, in the rest of the world as compared to Europe, uh, but many of whom uh, attribute this to uh, unfair trading and other stuff like that. What I'm saying here, uh, is, you know, uh, is that uh, this collision between Europe uh, and the rest of us uh, is one that uh, changed the, the world and created a whole new social system. There's a, new so there's a social system uh, that exists now, not a lot of different social systems that might have been the reality before this, but a new social system uh, that came into existence through European uh, slavery and colonialism, or colonial slavery, because I think even to characterize 
what happened to African people as slavery uh, is to buy into like the definition uh, that Europeans have given, uh, even Marx gave to uh, this uh, whole question of the, uh, the uh, uh, development of human society, which they characterize as from, uh, uh, from primitive communism to slavery to uh, feudalism to capitalist to communism. And what we are saying is that what happened to African people here was the same thing that happened to African people in other places. It's colonialism. Colonialism. It's colonial slavery. It's, it's not slavery. Because when they were talking about, when Marx has put forth this concept of slavery, and when others have talked about slavery, that's why they come and they tell you today, well, slavery existed everywhere. You've heard that before. White people come up and say, well, you can't just talk about that. Slavery existed everywhere. Uh, uh, we are not talking about the slavery that existed everywhere. We're not talking about uh, what uh, 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 Rome did to Spartacus. <laughs> We're not talking about that. Uh, we, we, if anything, we mock uh, uh, the communists who call themselves Spartacus League uh, on the one hand, while they will ignore uh, Dessalines, uh, who in Haiti, who led the, and Spartacus was defeated. But Dessalines succeeded in crushing the, uh, Napoleon's best armies and the first successful slave uh, rebellion in history, and yet they never call themselves the Dessalines League or even the Toussaint L'Ouverture League. They are the Spartacus League because that's how they define their relationship to the rest of us. Y'all with me on that? Yeah, it's a criticism. So, uh, uh, the early materialists, too, sought uh, for this. Uh, behind all the changing appearances, they look for something which never changes. Uh, but while idealists look for the eternal and changeless in the realm of spirit, these materialists look for it in the material world itself, and, and they found it in the ultimate material uh, particle, the eternal and indestructible atom. Uh, atom is a Greek word meaning unbreakable. So uh, uh, if you, uh, as old as I, and then of course th that would make you God, uh, it would, uh, that's so funny. <laughs> that was not an assault on idealism. <laughs> um, um, Now, you know, I was taught this when I was in school. You know, the atom is, is indestructible and the atom never changes and stuff like that. That's what we were taught. Uh, but f uh, for such materialists then, all changes were produced by the movement and interaction of unchanging atoms. Uh, this is a very ancient theory put forward over 2,000 years ago in Greece. And then it says, and earlier still in India. We don't talk about India. Greece is the model that they talk about. Europe. And I'm saying that this whole question of uh, materialism, you know, even 2,000 years ago in Greece, they, they're talking about, but even earlier in India, and even earlier uh, uh, in Africa, and even earlier uh, uh, in places that are uh, attributed to, to the Arabs. I mean, uh, they talk about materialism, uh, et cetera, when uh, the Arabs are the one who, it says, introduced the zero uh, to uh, European mathematics. Uh, then they, they say introduce the zero to mathematics, but it didn't introduce the zero to mathematics. It was European mathematics. Arabs, obviously, the Arabs already had it, right? So they didn't introduce it to themselves, they, didn't, they introduced the European mathematics. And yet, what we're looking at is something that attributes uh, science and development and materialism. Uh, 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 and dialectics to uh, European phenomenon so that they can't. They simply mention uh, still earlier in, in India. It's like that book that uh, a comrade gave me uh, that talks about how uh, 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 in the 1970s, uh, the black revolution, uh, uh, revolutionary nationalism or, uh, was dead, uh, except, uh, except uh, in a few cases like the African People's Socialist Party. They don't say nothing else about the party. They liquidated all the 70s and everything the party is about uh, 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 and this is what they're doing here as well. Uh, but Indians did something, and so did the party in the 1970s. We were the African Revolution in the 1970s. We are the 19, African Revolution in the 2000 and, and in the 21st century. 
Uh, and in its day, it was a very progressive theory. That is to say, um, uh, a, very, a great weapon against idealism and superstition. The Roman poet Lucretius, for example, explained in his philosophical poem on the nature of things that the purpose of the atomistic theory of the Greek philosopher Epicurus was to demonstrate uh, what the elements out of, uh, demonstrate what are the elements out of which everything is formed and how everything comes to pass without the intervention of gods. That was progressive for them. Thus there was born a materialism which saw the world as consisting of hard, uh, impe impenetrable material particles and which understood all change as arising from nothing but the motion and interaction of such particles that don't change. Uh, you all right, comrade? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Struggle with it. <laughs> this theory was revived in modern times. In the 16th and 17th century, philosophers and scientists turned to it in their fight against feudal uh, Catholic philosophy. And uh, I love this because it's true. One, one uh, European philosopher of that period that I really have uh, appreciate so much what this comrade uh, said, and it holds true even today uh, in, in the 21st century. And that was a, a philosopher, a French philosopher, whose name was Diderot. And uh, he de Diderot declared uh, that man should never be free until the last king has been strangled with the intestines of the last priest. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was a pretty serious statement, and it was a story against so <laughs> I like that. Uh, <laughs> but this modern materialism proved to be much richer in content than, than the ancient, for it tried to work out what were the laws of interaction of material particles, and so to present a picture of how all phenomena, from merely physical changes uh, in the life of man, uh, resulted from the motion and interaction of separate parts of matter. In this way, by the 18th century, they had approached the, uh, the characteristics of modern theories of mechanistic materialism, um, a bourgeois philosophy. Mechanistic materialism was, in essence, an ideology, a mode of uh, theorizing of the rising bourgeoisie. In order to understand it, we must understand, first of all, that it arose and developed in opposition to feudal idealism, ideology, that it, its critical edge was directed against feudal ideas, that it was, in fact, the most radical of all bourgeois forms of opposition against the feudal outlook. And Diderot is one of the examples of that, I think. Uh, in the period of the rise of the bourgeoisie, the feudal social relations were shattered. And so were the feudal ideas embodied in the Catholic philosophy in which those social relations were enshrined. The feudal system, uh, whose economic basis lay in the exploitation of the serfs by the feudal proprietors, involved complex social relations of dependence, subordination, and allegiance. All this was reflected not only in social and political philosophy, but also in the philosophy of nature. I just want to say that uh, we are also talking about the time of the rise of Marx, uh, because uh, with the uh, collapse of uh, the, uh, the feudal economy, uh, uh, the social system, uh, that also meant the collapse of the fundamental ideology, the ideas uh, that uh, were necessary to uh, support and maintain this system. Uh, that grew from it. That was called a superstructure. So you had an economic base of feudalism, and from this grew a superstructure of ideas and what have you, institutions. And uh, uh, this is uh, with the death of uh, feudalism. But and shortly in its wake, we see the rise of like Marx uh, and Marxism. We see the rise of nihilism. We see the rise of, uh, of uh, anarchy. And, and that makes sense, because all of these were forces that were attack, attacking uh, the, uh, the feudal uh, state. Uh, and, and, and so doing, ascribing to the feudal state um, uh, uh, a, a character uh, uh, that, uh, that generalized an assault on the state itself. Those the anarchists and the nihilists. The nihilists believe in destroying every damn thing. You know, uh, and the anarchists and the Marxists, everybody 
All of these were uh, explanations that, uh, uh, that were uh, struggling to supplant uh, the ideas of, uh, of feudalism. That is, and feudalism, again, is a, is a social system and that rests upon the material basis of the exploitation of the, of the, of the serfs, of the feudal, this relationship between uh, uh, the peasants and the nobility and the landlords. This was the fundamental contradiction. In fact, uh, one of the most, two, at least two of the most uh, uh, important uh, contributors to uh, anarchy, philosophical anarchism, uh, were themselves uh, either, uh, they were part of the landed gentry, you know, the, the landlord class. And Marx himself, uh, while not a part of the landed gentry and couldn't be called a part of the bourgeoisie proper, but he was uh, one of the upper classes. And his wife uh, was, uh, could be, uh, you know, considered, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you would say uh, part of the gentry, but she was really upper class people, person too. So, you know, you saw uh, these manifestations of assault, uh, uh, ideological, philosophical assault, uh, on the uh, philosophy of, uh, of, uh, of feudalism. The, the, and, and this is natural. You have this new uh, social system coming into existence, uh, and you have to, along with that, uh, what a part of that social system is a set of ideas uh, that attempts to uh, explain, uh, to offer up uh, a philosophical explanation for this reality, this new relationship. And they were contending, you know, the capitalists themselves, you know, I think Adam Smith, I think may have been uh, a factor here uh, somewhere around that t same time frame. Uh, uh, this was the one who I think they attribute to uh, given the first uh, coherent and cogent uh, uh, description of capitalism uh, as it was, has come to be recognized and respected by the bourgeoisie up, even up to this day. Uh, uh, Marx and Engels, uh, and these again, these were, these were not uh, workers, <laughs> you know, these were uh, people who were uh, closely affixed to and, and sometimes hated uh, uh, the, the, the feudalism and uh, hated the bourgeoisie, the new uh, uh, social system that was given birth by this process. Uh, because uh, capitalism uh, in its raw, naked form uh, was uh, horrible uh, to uh, European workers. Uh, I mean, this is the birth of uh, you know, Christmas Carol that uh, you can't live in, in what they call the Western world without being familiar with Christmas Carol, without being familiar with uh, Scrooge and Tiny Tim, and uh, who Scrooge became the prototypical uh, capitalist uh, who was selfish and didn't even believe in Christmas, right? And, and, you know, who even uh, exploited his little crippled uh, nephew or one of them, uh, uh, and Crockett, what's Crockett's name? The Crockett was, I think, his nephew or something. No, not t Tiny Tim was a little crippled fellow that I cried so much for as a child. Uh, but uh, but uh, the point is that uh, uh, even, you know, this, uh, you know, was an attempt to uh, look at what was happening to white workers. And I mean, you had children working in factories, white children working in factories, and, and sometimes uh, people losing limbs and stuff in these factories. So capitalism was horrible uh, in Europe, but not, so <laughs> not as horrible as what we were experiencing as a part of the process of giving rise to capitalism, not as horrible as the slavery and all the other stuff that you know, came into existence. So a, a time, for, a period, you saw real uh, this, this, uh, discussions in opposition to capitalism in Europe. You saw uprisings in Europe fighting against capital and capitalism. Uh, uh, and uh, you saw uh, the French Revolution, even as France was uh, uh, holding Haiti uh, in a state of slavery. You saw, uh, and con subsequent to the French Revolution, which uh, the Marxists characterized as one of the most progressive, most important phenomena in, in, in history, of the working class when the French Revolution was crushed, uh, 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 many of the people who were on the front line of making the French Revolution uh, ended up uh, sent to, uh, was it New Caledonia? Uh, uh, in the Pacific. Uh, these white people end up, uh, the children, uh, their children are now the ones who dominate uh, the black people in New Caledonia. 
Uh, they become the majority population. They took over, and et cetera, et cetera. And these were, these were the children of the people who uh, were making the French Revolution. You cannot un understand this unless you understand the true origin of uh, the social system we're looking at uh, and how, and it refutes many notions that, uh, uh, that's being passed down from generation to generation about uh, the, uh, the, by Marxist uh, analyses. Um, I didn't intend to go off on a tangent, but uh, so uh, where are we? Okay, uh, so we say that um, the fuel system whose economic basis lay in the exploitation of serfs by the fuel proprietors involved complex social relationships of dependence, subordination, and allegiance. All this was reflected not only in social and political philosophy, but also in the philosophy of nature. It was typical of the natural philosophy of the feudal period that everything in nature was explained in terms of its proper place in the system of the universe, in terms of its supposed position of dependence and subordination in that system, and of the end of purpose which, and of the end of or purpose uh, uh, which it existed to serve. Um, the bourgeois philosophers and scientists destroyed these feudal uh, ideas about nature. They regarded nature as a system of bodies in interaction and rejoiced and rejecting all the feudal dogma. They called for the investigation of nature in order to discover how nature really worked. Well, I got a hunch that there are some people who would have told them about that. The investigation of nature advanced hand in hand with the geographical discoveries uh, the development of trade and transport, <laughs> the improvement of machinery and manufacturers. Do you see what, I, what was contained in just that sentence alone? The investigation of nature advanced hand in hand with the geographical discoveries, the development of trade and transport, uh, the improvement of machinery and, and manufacturers. You see what's contained there, right? That's the whole decision, discussion. Of, uh, of slavery and colonialism encapsulated in just this thing and how they were related to the emergence of the machinery and manufacturing. That's encapsulated in that one sentence is what you find there. The greatest strides were made in the mechanical scientists, closely connected as they were with the needs of technology. So it came about that materialist theory was enriched as a result of the scientific investigation of nature and in particular by the mechanical sciences. You know, uh, Napoleon, it was at 18 something, Napoleon uh, sent uh, several hundred scientists uh, and, and scientists of, from different fields uh, to Egypt. And they literally, this is literal truth, they went there and they studied there. They got all kinds of information. At one time, uh, it was recognized that uh, that uh, French society rested upon Egyptian civilization. It was recognized that at one time. And uh, that's where uh, that, the time frame in which they brought back that obelisk that you see sitting uh, uh, on the main drag in Paris. The, uh, 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 say it, somebody in French, what's it called? Chancelier, something like that. Come on, Penny, you speak French. Say it again. She's whispering. Okay. Uh, uh, but uh, that's the reality. Um, so, um, and so much of what we talk about in the development of, of European and French uh, civilization and sciences and stuff, I mean, there's all kinds of evidence scattered everywhere. You can see where there's stolen science. I mean, you can go to, uh, to France, go to France, go to the Louvre, uh, which is the you know, the most significant museum they have and one of the most significant museums in the world. And look at the, go to the Egyptian uh, collection there. Uh, and you will see stuff created in Egypt 4,000 years ago that still have technological and, and functional, not only utilization, uh, but uh, uh, you find the same chair. I mean, it's made, you know, in Egypt 4,000 years ago, where they had indoor plumbing, you know, uh, uh, and uh, you would see, you know, like uh, cosmo 
cosmology, is that what you call the study of the universe? And then you would see cosmetology, uh, you know, uh, in Egypt, you know, right there in Egypt. And so, you know, I mean, and this is in the museum that we're looking at. And this whole crap about the superiority and, the, and how Europe in, introduced the world to this and that, you can, they, they, what they stole out of Egypt fills European um, museums all over the world. Uh, and they're still discovering stuff and what have you, you know. Um, and Europe, as I said, was uh, recently introduced uh, uh, to, uh, to human civilization. Um, so anyway, and this is not a European bashing thing, because I don't believe in bashing Europeans. <laughs> so, um, but it's interesting, like I said, that just, you know, what you could find just in that one sentence there. Um, So uh, this determined at once the strength and the weakness, the achievement and the limitations of materialist theory. Uh, what pushed the theory forward was, uh, was so Engels right, the powerful and ever more rapidly unrushing progress of science and industry, unquote. But it remained predominantly mechanical because only the mechanical sciences had attained any high degree of development. It's specific, but at that time, uh, inevitable limitation was this exclusive application of the standards of, mechan of, me of, of mechanics. The mechanistic way of understanding nature did not arise, however, simply from the fact that at that, that time, it was only the mechanistic science, mechanical sciences, which had made any great progress. It was deeply rooted in the class outlook of the most progressive bourgeois philosophers. And this led to their turning exclusively to the mechanical sciences for their inspiration. Just as the bourgeois uh, Z, oh, we are really deep into this, aren't we? Okay, so where are we? Uh, so we've used considerable amount. So what I would really, 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 really ask people to do is you know, read the last few pages of, uh, of this based on in part of what we've already talked about, I really hope that you will look at what we've already discussed in this process. And I think that you would also be helped uh, looking at that if you went to chapter three, was it, that we looked at, uh, when we look at the theory of uh, African internationalism in uh, the uneasy equilibrium, the political report uh, to the sixth Congress of the African People's Socialist Party. And here what you'll find is the actual working out, the in terms of uh, policies, in terms of program uh, uh, practice of, uh, of, of uh, dialectic historical materialist philosophical principles. And uh, I think that's important because uh, today uh, it is absolutely necessary for us to, uh, to say that we're African internationalists and to say, who are you? Uh, in terms of making this contest now, because the bourgeoisie disguises itself. You know, it lives next door to us, and it comes to the same meetings that we attend and what have you, and it calls itself black nationalist sometimes and pan-Africanist and all kinds of communists, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so, you know, we need to be able to understand who they are. They sometimes are anarchists. Uh, sometimes they're just self-motivating individuals who uh, have this extraordinary love affair with themselves that most ordinary human beings don't, uh, you know, can't uh, connect to. Uh, but we need to be able to say that because you cannot, you can debate and struggle with someone once you know what is the, the, the philosophical basis of the, the struggle you're involved in. You can understand why somebody uh, uh, is doing something and you can agree or not agree with it because you know what informs what it is that they do. Uh, and that's extremely important. So we want to clarify this. We want to uh, make sure that we recognize the bourgeoisie even in our midst. Sometimes we sleep with the bourgeoisie, you know, or people who are, uh, you know, uh, informed by the philosophy of the bourgeoisie and uh, uh, et cetera. And so we need to be able to recognize that to, to be able to, to forward this struggle because our people have to be free. And it's going to take science to free our people. And that's why we have to have a scientific approach to every question, scientific approach. Uh, to philosophy, just because you say you black this or black that, you know, you need to have the uh, a philosophical basis that's uh, based in science that's responsible because Africa 
has to be free. And then uh, uh, in the process and subsequent to being free, uh, we have to cure malaria. We have to build infrastructure all over the African world. Uh, we have to create hospitals and universities and all these things. And we're not going to be able to wish that into existence. And just hating a white man is not going to do it. And just having melanin is not going to be enough. And so we have to have a scientific approach. And that's why we call ourselves scientists. And we, we uh, embrace a scientific understanding uh, of uh, our place uh, in the world, our destiny uh, in the world. And that's what we call uh, scientific philosophy, African internationalism. So uh, I've said as much as I have time. In fact, I've over uh, done this. When I saw Comrade uh, Abdullah fidgeting and getting up to come over here, I, sh I should have recognized that it was a statement that, like imperialism, my time was up. But go ahead. <laughs> We have people, it's, it's truly amazing. We have people listening from all over the country, all over the world. We have people from Lagos, Nigeria, Kansas City, Missouri, Miami, Florida, St. Petersburg, Florida, St. Myers, Florida, Hyattsville, Florida, Maryland, Zambia, Chicago, Illinois, Boston, Massachusetts, Kingston, uh, New York, uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Windhoek, Namibia, Rotterdam, Netherlands, Toulouse, France. So, Chairman, your audience is just increasing mm. uh, dramatically because of your profound analysis of this uh, theory of African internationalism that's sweeping the world. So it's now time to open up with questions from our audience and online viewers. We want to appreciate uh, everyone who's tuning in via Facebook and YouTube, and also appreciate all your engagement. Please continue to invite your friends and family through the study and share widely on all our social media. Thank you. Uh -huh. Is there any questions from the uh -huh. uh, Sister Kamal Bayi. Uhura. Uhura. Um, I just really want to appreciate um, this study, and it's very heavy. Like, but I, I want to see if I'm on the right page. So, what I was listening to, Chairman, um, I really want to unite with you, saying that you're going to write, um, you know, write this because I think that would be incredible. What, you know, as someone um, like the African working class, what I was understanding. Um, through this study, how important theory is and how um, it has a material interest in like how your theory. And um, Africans, you know, we've been attacked and have all these different analyses of all this different stuff, but it all have a material interest in it. And even, it's not some small, it's not some like mediocre thing. That's what I was mm -hmm. really understanding. Mm -hmm. And then so if you can allow, if you can say more about that, and then um, I was also thinking to myself that um, you know us understanding that we African nationalists and how we see the world, we have a material interest, and a material interest is you know um, it's for Africa to be free, and you know in uh, these contending lines that we struggle with have to be struggled with yes. because it's not some small thing, but our freedom is you know hitched to that. And so uh, the question of theory is not some small thing, but the African working class, for the first time, has a theory to bring us up out of this. And anything that contend with that is, you know, like a, a, a bullet, um, mm -hmm. you know, in our head. That it's not something that we can play with. It's not something like, well, I want to hold on to this and do this too. But that thing, you know, what I'm saying, if it don't say like how it's going to liberate Africa. Why are we holding on to it? Uhura. Uhura. I want to say, Comrade President uh, Kalambayi, um, that my experiences with you uh, recognizes, just like with my, most of African people, uh, the so called the limitation we have so called education. And uh, uh, most Africans, even with PhDs and all this other kind of stuff, are horribly uneducated. Just we haven't had a certain uh, relationship to the world because our world is generally speaking limited to the small spaces that the colonial, that the co colonizer, you know, has restricted us to. Even people who've gone to universities and what have you don't have access the same kind of access to the world as Europeans have access to the world and take certain kinds of things for granted. Uh, 
But, uh, uh, and, and, and I'm talking, that's even true of PhDs, but there are others of us who are even more limited in terms of access to the world. But I want to say that, um, Kamek Kalambayi, um, you are somebody who I've seen uh, with a profound uh, kind of understanding of dialectics. And uh, even if it's not structured, uh, even if it has not you know, uh, been developed uh, 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 in a way, uh, and, and materialism, and don't run from it. Don't run from the discussion of theory and stuff like that, because you, you do it magnificently. Your ability to even walk into a room, like I've seen you able to walk into a room and feel out of the audience and know exactly you know, how to deal with it and what to do. It's a, there's an aspect of dialectics that's so really important that most people can't do. It's like the difference. Uh, uh, I used to uh, like this uh, uh, fighter, who, a marvelous uh, Marvin Hagler. I liked him uh, particularly in opposition to Sugar Ray Leonard. And I didn't like Sugar Ray Leonard because he was a white man's champion. Uh, but uh, uh, the problem was that Hagler was a, a, a perfect boxer but he could not change. He had all the mechanics. He can go in, he knew how to throw hooks, you know, Bob even doing this other stuff, but he couldn't change. And Leonard was somebody who could change. Ali could change. He'd get into the ring, and Ali swore that he knew what he was going to do before he got there, but in midstream, he could change and make certain kinds of changes. And that's a certain dialectical approach that we, uh, we take to things as well. And uh, that's the thing that I've approached to you, being able to make that change, um, and you've learned how to do it over much of your life, whatever kinds of reasons in terms of your development. And, but you're right. Uh, how uh, theory is critical, because all of us are uh, uh, encumbered with theory. And usually, it's the theory of the ruling class. And uh, there have been times where uh, Africans, in particular, uh, you know, uh, we hear stories of Africans, they go to get the right juju and stuff like that, and then bullets won't hit them, et cetera. And so they are extraordinarily brave because they think bullets won't hit them, but they die. And uh, so <clears throat> we need to have science in our approach, you know, uh, to all of these questions. And, and your, your philosophy will inform your practice. And that's why you will see with the African People's Socialist Party, we don't just have, we don't just believe things, but the beliefs that we have make themselves manifest in the real world. That's what we're talking about, Black Power Blueprint. That's how we have all these other institutions. That's why we're in the process of winning freedom. And part of the process of winning freedom is creating our own independent African political economy and this kind of stuff. That's why we do it, because it's not just something we believe in theory. That's why 40 years ago about, we held a tribunal on reparations for African people. And now, you know, uh, 37 years later, we see, you know, people catching up doing that. That's why uh, five years ago, right here uh, uh, in Ferguson, uh, Illinois, we did the Black People's Grand Jury uh, that uh, uh, put the whole state and government on trial and put power in the hands of the African working class that some people dismiss because they say, well, <clears throat> you know, you really don't have the power. Yes, we do have the power. We have the, we, we've opened the door to that power and brought Africans into an understanding of the fact that we have to capture power. That differentiates us from people who simply blocked the interstates, that didn't tell anybody anything except how to block an interstate, especially when you can get the cooperation with the police who love for you to block interstates as long as you were not talking about taking power, right? So uh, anyway, you know, uh, theory make it, makes itself manifest in the real world in terms of our practice, and it's not just a small thing, it's a big old thing. Uhuru. Uhuru. Anybody else out there? Yes, yeah, Uhuru. Have, uh, a question from Kimba in Philly. He's doing live. He commented, I was wondering if small business owners are part of the working class. If this, if this depended, is this dependent on whether or not they have workers or not? Well, you know, that's what part of what the argument is, but I want to say, the fundamental contradictions Africans have with economy all over the world is, is not the contradiction between capitalism and capitalist development and socialist development or communist development. The fundamental contradiction we have is between development and no development. You understand? But we do believe that it's the responsibility of the revolution uh, to do as we are doing now. Uh, with our uh, 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 projects, uh, like the Buy Black Power project that we've initiated uh, to win uh, these Africans who are trying to come into business to an anti-colonial stance. You went to a real anti-colonial stance. I'm not talking about 
uh, clowns uh, like who own billionaires uh, like Cyril Ramaphosa in South Africa or some other people like that, who their objective is to become part of the bourgeoisie. We're talking about these small businesses who are out there struggling, and to do so, to even be relatively successful, they have to go up against the, uh, the structures and restrictions placed on them by colonialism. So we're saying that we want to make people who are engaged or try to engage in economic activity consciously part of an anti-colonial movement that break all of the restrictions, destroy all of the impediments that's in placed on, on African economic development by the, our relationship to colonialism. That's the primary, that's the fundamental contradiction we are confronted with. And so we got some Africans who go into business and they want you to buy black, but they want, they're trying to join the system. They are not part of a process to destroy uh, colonial stranglehold on the African population, the African economic development. That's why we are moving toward uh, and creating structures and organizations to buy black power so that we're trying to bring African uh, uh, so-called entrepreneurs and business people into a conscious relationship under the leadership of a conscious revolutionary organization so that your economic activity is a part of the struggle against colonialism and hence uh, 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 a prelude uh, to a real victory of socialism. Uhuru. Regarding the comment that you made about people not knowing the origin of milk, uh, Adam in Rotterdam, uh, Netherlands, commented, Chairman, according to some research, most children in Dutch cities uh, think that milk comes from a major supermarket in the country. <laughs> the alienation of mankind from nature is also a result of the idealistic approach, the foundation of anti-dialectical dogmatic. Uhuru. Uhuru. Yes. This comrade, I don't know why this brother should be What's his name again? Adam. 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 Uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm just wondering if, if, have you? Do we have your application to the party? Are you in the party or something like that? You're pretty up on it. I, every time I see you, you're uh, in really moving it. So uh, Uhuru. Yeah. One more question from the audience. Okay. Uhuru. <laughs> All right. Comrade Chairwoman Penny Hess. Uhuru. Uhuru. always having to go yeah. by sentence by sentence and criticize this. Um, and I also um, really appreciate your analysis that um, Marx, even Marx, and Marx and Engels had said that the, what causes change is the internal contradiction, but yet they brought in this external, or Marx brought in the external question of what he called the primitive accumulation of capital. I just wanted to say really quick, also I love the phrase vulgar opinionism, mm -hmm. so, so true, <laughs> and versus um, African internationalism. But I just wanted to say that we are seeing the bourgeoisie in form of academia, the ruling class, politicians, the media, being affected by a mass understanding of African internationalism and that the subjects, the objects of history are fighting back even in these ways of demanding that uh, offensive murals and statues be taken down that represent you know, the conquest of, of African indigenous people. And of course, that you set the terms for that 50 year, more than 50 years ago in St. Petersburg, Florida by tearing down that anti-African colonial mural. And we see this in the beginning, you know, and I see more and more in academia the analysis that the enslavement of African people was the pivotal, the key question in the development of capitalism, even the question that Oxford University would have you, you come and speak there, that it has to, the bourgeoisie has to deal with this, but I just wanted to say that I have yet to see any white Marxist person that calls themselves Marxist today dealing with any yeah. of these questions whatsoever, yeah. and I just wanted to know if you could comment on that. Uhuru, I, I think that's right. Uhuru, uh, yes, come on. I'm to be self-critical. Uh -huh. We're out of time. Can you be brief? I hate to say that. To yeah, you. yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be extremely brief. I, I think that's ex absolutely right, what you've just said, that some of the fiercest uh, uh, supporters of, the, uh, of imperialism are people who characterize themselves as Marxist, communist, socialism, uh, socialists, et cetera, et cetera. They uh, fight uh, fiercely to uh, prevent the rise of the colonial subjects who will overturn the whole social system because as 
you know, um, Malcolm talked about the house Negro and the field Negro and how the house Negro always tried to protect the master's house. Well, that's not just true of the, um, of the Negroes. What he's defining here is the material interest that a sector of the population has in maintaining the status quo. You burn down, the, the, the field Negro burns down the house of the uh, master. He's all burns down the house of the how the house of the house Negro as well. And that's why the Marxist capitalists, that's why they could go all out and support El Salvador, support everything all around the world, but will not support the African revolution to overturn this system to make ourselves free because that would destroy uh, their house as well as the house uh, of the ruling class. And that was the problem that Marx had when the, that we just described earlier because the, the advent of the revolution that liberates the slave or the colonial subject is uh, something that tears down the house, not only the bourgeoisie, but the house that Marx lives in or lived in. And so uh, um, I want to yeah, say that. And, and yeah, it's been a serious fight that we've had and in terms of external factor. The, the problem with Marx here, or that I see fundamental, is that he was not able to recognize that what he was characterizing as this external thing has now changed the character of the whole process. It was no longer a European process. Uh, it was a process that contained uh, the slave and the slave master, the colonizer and the colonizer, and it was uh, the that and and that changed the dynamic so that the contradiction is not a contradiction between the oppressed uh, taller and uh, a European taller and ruling class, but now the fundamental contradiction is between uh, the uh, the uh, capitalist social system uh, and and the, uh, the uh, col colonial slaves uh, uh, around the world. That's the primary contradiction. That's where the, the class question is now located, and Marx was not able to see that. He was able to see the emergence and development of this thing that he called Europe uh, as a consequence of, uh, of uh, uh, what he called primitive accumulation, but he didn't recognize that as a whole new entity now comes into existence uh, through that process, and that's but dialectics helps us to understand. Uhuru. Thank you, Chairman. Let's <laughs> applaud the Chairman once again for that profound study. Uh, now to our announcements, because of time, we want everyone to know that if your question wasn't answered, one of our moderators will correspond with you and make sure that the Chairman sees your question. This study was brought to you by the Department of Agitation and Propaganda, winning the war of ideals. For your worldwide revolutionary news and analysis, visit theburningspirit.com the revolutionary radio dynamic shows and music by Africans all around the world, tuning into Black Power 96.3 FM broadcasting out of St. Petersburg, Florida, and accessible via the Black Power 96 app for Apple and Android, and online at blackpower96.org. Did you unite with what you heard today and want to learn more about how you can get involved with the African People's Socialist Party? Visit APSPUhuru.org for all information regarding how you can apply. Order your copy of Chairman O'Malley Yeshe Teller's la latest book, Vanguard, The Advanced Detachment of the African Revolution, The Political Report to the Seventh Congress at BurningSpearMarketplace.com. On Sunday, August 25th, from 3 o'clock to 6 p.m., the African People's Socialist Party will remember the African revolutionary giant, Omar Wally K. Fing in St. Petersburg, Florida, at 1245 18th Avenue South. We ask that everyone who can, who knew K. Fing, sympathizes with our movement, to come out and drove to honor and hold high the legacy of this comrade, the standard of party cadre, Omar Wally K. Fing, long live. Uh -huh. The International People's Democratic Uhura Movement invites you to attend our 2019 Impedum Convention. This year's convention is themed, the struggle is real. Real science, real revolutionaries, real solutions, real black power. Come join us September 13th through 15th at 4101 West Florissant Avenue, St. Louis, Missouri, as we expose the ways that Africans are facing genocide at the hands of white power and imperialism, and how our only solution is building Impedum, the leading organization in the struggle for bread, peace, black power, and reparations to African people. Register today at evenbright.com. Were you moved by Chairman's presentation this morning? You can bring the electrifying presentation to your school campus, bookstore, concert hall, and more to book Chairman O'Malley yesterday teller for the Vanguard 2019 International Speaking Tour. Contact the Hural Tours at info at omawaliyesterteller.org or call 727-914-3621. Sign up for the Marcus Garvey Legacy Cruise taking place December 14th through 19th. The Marcus Garvey Legacy Cruise is the annual fundraiser held to support 
the work of the African Socialist International. The African Socialist International is an organization made up of African people located virtually on every continent, continent dedicated to overturning the conditions faced by African people worldwide. Our cruise destinations are Half Moon Bay, Bahamas, Nassau, Bahamas, and Freeport, Bahamas. You can enjoy political education on board with the chairman on, on and off board excursions and more food than you can eat. To book, make your deposits, visit huralegacycruise.org or call the travel agent Linda Stern at 732-972-4171. If you want to further support the African Socialist International and the Marcus Garvey Legacy Cruise, make a donation by visiting Uhura, uhuralegacycruise.org. Thank you for tuning in. Make sure you like this, make sure you like and subscribe to the Burning Spear TV on YouTube to catch every episode of the Molly Taught Me Sunday Study. Uhuru, thank you. The revolution is real, it's live, and as some comrades say, it's lit, right? <laughs> Lit. Lit, lit. The revolution is lit.